Cambridge International Examinations International General Certificate of Secondary Education June Examination Series 2018 English as a Second Language Extended Tier Listening Comprehension Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the exam. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the exam. Teacher, please give out the question papers. And when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you are all ready, here is the exam. Questions 1 to 4. You will hear four short recordings. Answer each question on the line provided. Write no more than three words or a number for each detail. You will hear each recording twice. Question 1. A. What type of competition has the girl just won? B. What prize did the girl receive? Congratulations, Katie. Thanks, Joseph. I knew you were good at athletics a long time before you won the school tournament last year. But singing? I thought that was just a hobby. And you managed to beat everyone in this year's contest. Well, my mum persuaded me to enter. Honestly, I still can't believe I've won. What did you get for winning? Well, I'd have been happy with a medal or maybe a small gift like a book, so a laptop was totally unexpected. Congratulations, Katie. Thanks, Joseph. I knew you were good at athletics a long time before you won the school tournament last year, but singing? I thought that was just a hobby. And you managed to beat everyone in this year's contest. Well, my mum persuaded me to enter. Honestly, I still can't believe I've won. What did you get for winning? Well, I'd have been happy with a medal or maybe a small gift like a book, so a laptop was totally unexpected. Question 2. A. What does the woman want to celebrate at the restaurant? B. How much deposit does the woman have to pay? The Riverside Restaurant. Can I help you? I'd like to book a table for 12 people this Saturday. Around 6pm? Yes, that's fine. Is it for a special occasion? Well, we had a great time at your restaurant last month celebrating my birthday, and as it's my son's graduation, we've decided to come back. OK. Will you go for our set menu? Yes, please. Do you require payment in advance? Yes, for large groups of people we do. It'll be £60 in your case. But on the day you'll receive a discount if your total bill is more than £150. OK, I'll pop in tomorrow to sort things out. The Riverside Restaurant. Can I help you? I'd like to book a table for 12 people this Saturday. Around 6pm? Yes, that's fine. Is it for a special occasion? Well, we had a great time at your restaurant last month celebrating my birthday, and as it's my son's graduation, we've decided to come back. OK. Will you go for our set menu? Yes, please. Do you require payment in advance? Yes, for large groups of people we do. It'll be £60 in your case. But on the day, you'll receive a discount if your total bill is more than £150. OK. I'll pop in tomorrow to sort things out. Question 3. A. What is the boy reading about? B. When does the boy have to hand in his essay? What's that you're reading, Victor? Is it one of your sci-fi novels? 
Not this time, Emma. I was looking for an article on solar power for my chemistry project, but came across this one about extreme sports. I found out loads. Well, if you're interested in that, why not write about it in the essay we've got for homework? Why didn't I think of that? And there's plenty of time to complete it by Thursday. I thought the teacher wanted it this Wednesday. Well, last Friday she said she'd give us more time, remember? Oh, yes, that's good. What's that you're reading, Victor? Is it one of your sci-fi novels? Not this time, Emma. I was looking for an article on solar power for my chemistry project, but came across this one about extreme sports. I found out loads. Well, if you're interested in that, why not write about it in the essay we've got for homework? Why didn't I think of that? And there's plenty of time to complete it by Thursday. I thought the teacher wanted it this Wednesday. Well, last Friday she said she'd give us more time, remember? Oh, yes, that's good. Question 4. A. What can students get with the city card? B. Where can students apply for the city card? Following last year's success with the Go card, which helped students with travel tickets, we are now introducing a card called the City Card. The new card offers many discounts. To find out more about the places where you can use this card, there are information leaflets at the school reception and in the local library. If you're interested in signing up and obtaining this card, please go to the school website. Your card will be sent to you within a week and it's totally free. We hope you'll enjoy using it. Following last year's success with the Go Card, which helped students with travel tickets, we are now introducing a card called the City Card. The new card offers many discounts. To find out more about the places where you can use this card, there are information leaflets at the school reception and in the local library. If you're interested in signing up and obtaining this card, please go to the school website. Your card will be sent to you within a week and it's totally free. We hope you'll enjoy using it. That is the end of the four short recordings. In a moment you will hear question five. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 5. You will hear Marco Gatti, a wildlife journalist, giving a talk about wolves. Listen to the talk and complete the details below. Write one or two words or a number in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. Wolves are the largest members of the dog family. They've lived alongside humans for centuries and were once very common. History is full of stories about these amazing animals, and many societies have legends about wolves, praising their strength and loyalty, but above all, their courage. I love wolves, and have spent the past six years studying their behaviour in Italy, taking photographs and filming them. But not everyone feels the same way, and wolves have been hunted for centuries, which means that this species is now on the list of endangered animals. Many conservation trusts around the world have been set up to improve this situation. Some give money to various local wolf projects, while others focus on education as a way of altering how people feel about wolves. Thanks to these efforts, in recent years we've seen a comeback of wolves in some countries. But now let me tell you more about the grey wolf, which I chose for my research. It's the most common of the three main species of wolves. Although wolves may be quite fast over short distances, this isn't the main strategy they use when hunting. What they can do, however, is keep going for mile after mile when hunting, 
and it's this ability that makes up for their lack of speed over long distances. Wolves usually live and hunt in vast areas, known as territories, and tend to live in a group called a pack. Although some packs have been known to cover an area as large as 450 square kilometers, or as little as 50, they usually require approximately 250 square kilometers. A wolf's habitat can vary from grasslands to deserts, and in some rare cases, even urban areas. In the region where I'm doing my research, wolves are often seen in the meadows and forests. Nevertheless, their preferred home is in the mountains, which offer plenty of cover. I was particularly interested in grey wolves' social behaviour. They seem to have this fascinating system of organising themselves within the pack. The most powerful wolf in the pack and his mate have roles very similar to those of human parents, and it is their duty to look after their family members. This social order means that every member has their role within the pack. Their social behaviour also means that they do not hunt alone, unlike foxes or wild dogs. These animals will fight each other, whereas grey wolves share food with other pack members. Wolves are also great communicators. They use their sense of smell to find out about other wolves in the area and their territory boundaries. Very few people realise, though, that wolves rely much more frequently on body language than on sounds like barking or howling to communicate within the pack. They can express their moods this way as well as their position within the group. Now, let's have a look at a clip of wolves doing just that. Now you will hear the talk again. Wolves are the largest members of the dog family. They've lived alongside humans for centuries and were once very common. History is full of stories about these amazing animals, and many societies have legends about wolves, praising their strength and loyalty, but above all their courage. I love wolves and have spent the past six years studying their behaviour in Italy taking photographs and filming them. But not everyone feels the same way, and wolves have been hunted for centuries, which means that this species is now on the list of endangered animals. Many conservation trusts around the world have been set up to improve this situation. Some give money to various local wolf projects, while others focus on education as a way of altering how people feel about wolves. Thanks to these efforts, in recent years, we've seen a comeback of wolves in some countries. But now, let me tell you more about the grey wolf, which I chose for my research. It's the most common of the three main species of wolves. Although wolves may be quite fast over short distances, this isn't the main strategy they use when hunting. What they can do, however, is keep going for mile after mile when hunting, and it's this ability that makes up for their lack of speed over long distances. Wolves usually live and hunt in vast areas, known as territories, and tend to live in a group called a pack. Although some packs have been known to cover an area as large as 450 square kilometres, or as little as 50, they usually require approximately 250 square kilometres. A wolf's habitat can vary from grasslands to deserts, and in some rare cases, even urban areas. In the region where I'm doing my research, wolves are often seen in the meadows and forests. Nevertheless, their preferred home is in the mountains, which offer plenty of cover. I was particularly interested in grey wolves' social behaviour. They seem to have this fascinating system of organising themselves within the pack. The most powerful wolf in the pack and his mate have roles very similar to those of human parents, and it is their duty to look after their family members. 
this social order means that every member has their role within the pack. Their social behaviour also means that they do not hunt alone, unlike foxes or wild dogs. These animals will fight each other, whereas grey wolves share food with other pack members. Wolves are also great communicators. They use their sense of smell to find out about other wolves in the area and their territory boundaries. Very few people realise, though, that wolves rely much more frequently on body language than on sounds like barking or howling to communicate within the pack. They can express their moods this way as well as their position within the group. Now, let's have a look at a clip of wolves doing just that. That is the end of the talk. In a moment you will hear question 6. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 6. You will hear six people talking about photography. For each of speakers 1 to 6, choose from the list, A to G, which opinion each speaker expresses. Write the letter in the appropriate box. Use each letter only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. You will hear the recordings twice. Speaker 1 I started taking photographs some years ago. First, it was just the usual family snaps of special occasions, but I got more into it after photography was offered as one of the art classes at school. I'd tried to express myself with paints and brushes, but that just wasn't for me. Our teacher used to be a photographer herself and suggested I should give photography a go as a profession. I'm not sure, though. I think... Once you do something for a living, it takes all the fun out of it. Speaker 2 My father and grandfather are keen fishermen, and they thought I'd take up this hobby too. So every summer holiday I'd spend some time going with them and sitting by the river waiting for them to catch something. I wasn't really into fishing and got incredibly bored just sitting there. That's why I started taking my camera with me to keep busy. These days I'm always on business trips and still have my camera in my bag as taking photos at the end of the day helps me unwind. Speaker 3 one day I thought I'd better set myself a new challenge, so I signed up for a photography course. I don't have a natural talent when it comes to art, and my first attempts at photography were complete disasters. A friend suggested concentrating on history or geography instead, but I just kept going. I guess my hard work and perseverance makes up for what I lack in talent. Looking back, I'm really satisfied with myself for turning things around and completing the course. As a result, I now produce rather decent photos. Speaker 4 When my family moved, I found it difficult to fit in at my new school. Mum thought a new hobby might help and suggested joining a photography club. I went along but didn't think much of it. I occasionally went out with some friends to take photos, but then one of them asked me to supply photographs for the school magazine. I couldn't believe how much pleasure I got from doing it. And in the end, I settled into my new school.
Speaker 5 When I asked my father about studying photography at university, he was really pleased. He never pushed me into anything, but I knew he was secretly hoping that I'd be just as mad about photography as he and his father were. The fact that I decided to pursue it as a career was something that made him incredibly proud. Even now, as a professional photographer, I still love hearing what he thinks of my work and how he'd improve some of the shots. Speaker 6 I've been taking pictures since I was about ten. My art teacher at college noticed my talent and thought I was pretty good. She even encouraged me to do a degree course. I really hope I can go on to become a photographer and do it for a living. I was rather shocked when my parents opposed my decision. They didn't realise how much I enjoyed photography, but I managed to persuade them in the end, and now I'm well into my second year at university. Now you will hear the six speakers again. Speaker 1 I started taking photographs some years ago. First, it was just the usual family snaps of special occasions, but I got more into it after photography was offered as one of the art classes at school. I'd tried to express myself with paints and brushes, but that just wasn't for me. Our teacher used to be a photographer herself and suggested I should give photography a go as a profession. I'm not sure, though. I think once you do something for a living, it takes all the fun out of it. Speaker 2 My father and grandfather are keen fishermen, and they thought I'd take up this hobby too. So every summer holiday I'd spend some time going with them and sitting by the river waiting for them to catch something. I wasn't really into fishing and got incredibly bored just sitting there. That's why I started taking my camera with me to keep busy. These days I'm always on business trips and still have my camera in my bag as taking photos at the end of the day helps me unwind. Speaker 3 One day I thought I'd better set myself a new challenge, so I signed up for a photography course. I don't have a natural talent when it comes to art, and my first attempts at photography were complete disasters. A friend suggested concentrating on history or geography instead, but I just kept going. I guess my hard work and perseverance makes up for what I lack in talent. Looking back, I'm really satisfied with myself for turning things around and completing the course. As a result, I now produce rather decent photos. Speaker 4 When my family moved, I found it difficult to fit in at my new school. Mum thought a new hobby might help and suggested joining a photography club. I went along, but didn't think much of it. I occasionally went out with some friends to take photos, but then one of them asked me to supply photographs for the school magazine. I couldn't believe how much pleasure I got from doing it. And in the end, I settled into my new school. Speaker 5 When I asked my father about studying photography at university, he was really pleased. He never pushed me into anything, but I knew he was secretly hoping that I'd be just as mad about photography as he and his father were. The fact that I decided to pursue it as a career was something that made him incredibly proud. Even now, as a professional photographer, I still love hearing what he thinks of my work and how he'd improve some of the shots. Speaker 5
Speaker 6. I've been taking pictures since I was about 10. My art teacher at college noticed my talent and thought I was pretty good. She even encouraged me to do a degree course. I really hope I can go on to become a photographer and do it for a living. I was rather shocked when my parents opposed my decision. They didn't realise how much I enjoyed photography, but I managed to persuade them in the end, and now I'm well into my second year at university. That is the end of question 6. In a moment, you will hear question 7. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 7. You will hear a radio presenter talking to an actor called Henrik Carlsson about his life and work. Listen to the interview and look at the questions. For each question, choose the correct answer, A, B or C, and put a tick in the appropriate box. You will hear the interview twice. This afternoon, I'm talking to Henrik Carlsson, an actor who plays a detective in the TV series The Green Light. Henrik, for those who haven't seen it, can you briefly tell us what it's about? Well, this being a crime series, the audience gets to see how the police work. Each series focuses on a different case. While viewers get to find out a bit about the main characters and their everyday lives, I suppose the main message we get from my character in the series is that life isn't about giving up, even though you feel like it sometimes. And what makes this series so appealing to people worldwide? Recently, there have been many crime series attracting audiences with thrilling plots. Because of this competition, the writers on our show always try and come up with something different. I love the fact that none of the characters are perfect. They develop with each series, just like people do in real life. And for me, that's the key to real success. I'm always touched by fan mail praising my acting too. What was your reaction after you learnt your co-star wouldn't be returning? Sophie Adamson, who plays my female partner detective, is a good friend of mine and she dropped a hint that this might happen. That's why it wasn't a complete shock to me. But I know there'll be a lot of fans feeling let down by her decision. It left me with a bit of a worry, as I'll have to get used to someone new, which is a lot of pressure on my part. Apart from the series, you have a new film coming out soon. Did you have to consider anything after accepting your part? Well, there was a bit of a dilemma really involving the family. The movie is a historical drama, shot abroad over six months, so I had to decide whether to go back home regularly or relocate my whole family. In the end, they just came to visit me on set whenever possible. The kids loved watching me riding a horse, something I'd been taught just a few weeks earlier. Thanks to my beard and long hair, I already had just the look the director needed. You became a professional actor in your late thirties. Are there any benefits starting this late in life? Well, a younger colleague of mine thinks that at auditions I get more respect than him because of my age. I don't know about that, but I certainly feel I can be more convincing in my roles thanks to my life experience. One thing is for sure, though, getting bad reviews from critics isn't easy to accept, whatever your age. But what did you do before turning to professional acting? I did performing arts at university, but after graduation, my heart was set on exploring foreign countries. I was good at languages, so I was planning to travel and teach to earn a living. In the end, my father thought the most sensible thing would be to help him out in his company, and I agreed. 
How does it feel to be a famous actor? In my profession, I just can't help wondering if my latest role will also be the last. Some high-profile actors suffer from too much unwanted attention. Personally, I only get photographed when I go abroad because my fans back home respect my private life, which I appreciate. My wife gets upset by what the press writes about us sometimes, but I just laugh it off. And any major projects on the horizon? My friend's written a script and is hoping to give a new generation of actors a chance to act in it. He approached me to see if I'd be interested in directing it, something that had never crossed my mind. I'll think about it. What I've always longed for is to make it as a stage actor. The reaction from a live audience is something you can never get as a film actor. Thank you, Henrik, and good luck. Now you will hear the interview again. This afternoon, I'm talking to Henrik Carlsen, an actor who plays a detective in the TV series The Green Light. Henrik, for those who haven't seen it, can you briefly tell us what it's about? Well, this being a crime series, the audience gets to see how the police work. Each series focuses on a different case. While viewers get to find out a bit about the main characters and their everyday lives, I suppose the main message we get from my character in the series is that life isn't about giving up, even though you feel like it sometimes. And what makes this series so appealing to people worldwide? Recently, there have been many crime series attracting audiences with thrilling plots. Because of this competition, the writers on our show always try and come up with something different. I love the fact that none of the characters are perfect. They develop with each series, just like people do in real life. And for me, that's the key to real success. I'm always touched by fan mail praising my acting too. What was your reaction after you learnt your co-star wouldn't be returning? Sophie Adamson, who plays my female partner detective, is a good friend of mine and she dropped a hint that this might happen. That's why it wasn't a complete shock to me. But I know there'll be a lot of fans feeling let down by her decision. It left me with a bit of a worry, as I'll have to get used to someone new, which is a lot of pressure on my part. Apart from the series, you have a new film coming out soon. Did you have to consider anything after accepting your part? Well, there was a bit of a dilemma really involving the family. The movie is a historical drama, shot abroad over six months, so I had to decide whether to go back home regularly or relocate my whole family. In the end, they just came to visit me on set whenever possible. The kids loved watching me riding a horse, something I'd been taught just a few weeks earlier. Thanks to my beard and long hair, I already had just the look the director needed. You became a professional actor in your late thirties. Are there any benefits starting this late in life? Well, a younger colleague of mine thinks that at auditions I get more respect than him because of my age. I don't know about that, but I certainly feel I can be more convincing in my roles thanks to my life experience. One thing is for sure, though, getting bad reviews from critics isn't easy to accept, whatever your age. But what did you do before turning to professional acting? I did performing arts at university, but after graduation, my heart was set on exploring foreign countries. I was good at languages so I was planning to travel and teach to earn a living. In the end, my father thought the most sensible thing would be to help him out in his company, and I agreed. How does it feel to be a famous actor? In my profession, I just can't help wondering if my latest role will also be the last. Some high-profile actors suffer from too much unwanted attention. Personally, I only get photographed when I go abroad because my fans back home respect my private life, which I appreciate. My wife gets upset by what the press writes about us sometimes, but I just laugh it off.
And any major projects on the horizon? My friend's written a script and is hoping to give a new generation of actors a chance to act in it. He approached me to see if I'd be interested in directing it, something that had never crossed my mind. I'll think about it. What I've always longed for is to make it as a stage actor. The reaction from a live audience is something you can never get as a film actor. Thank you, Henrik, and good luck. That is the end of the interview. In a moment, you will hear question 8. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 8, Part A. You will hear a pilot called Tracy Curtis Taylor giving a talk about her flight over Africa. Listen to the talk and complete the notes in Part A. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. Thank you for inviting me to be part of your inspirational women celebrations. My name is Tracy Curtis Taylor, and I'm a commercial airline pilot. But my biggest passion is flying vintage planes, which are old aeroplanes built during the first half of the 20th century. Planes have been an important part of my life from very early on, thanks to my father, who often took me to see them in Canada, where my family moved to from Britain. But it wasn't until I relocated to New Zealand in my 20s that I fell in love with vintage aeroplanes. Around this time, I started researching the pioneering female pilots of vintage planes, and one name in particular caught my attention, Mary Heath. She was an extraordinary woman whose solo flight from Cape Town in South Africa to London in 1928 brought her international fame. I felt she deserved to be brought back into the spotlight, so I decided to recreate her flight over Africa. My preparations for the trip took nearly five years, time mainly spent looking for a sponsor to help with the expenses. After that, finding a suitable plane or attracting media attention to create interest in such a project wasn't as hard as I'd expected. On the 2nd of November 2013, I was finally ready to take off from Cape Town International Airport. The first stage of my flight followed the coast of South Africa to Port Elizabeth. I knew I was in for a treat, with stunning views, though the sighting of dolphins was unforgettable. Flying along the coast was so peaceful. Using the same type of open-topped plane as Mary Heath herself meant I encountered numerous challenges that she'd also had to contend with, such as frequent weather changes and fuel shortages. Luckily, Mary didn't have to put up with extensive paperwork when stopping over at different airports. I finally reached my destination after two months, while Mary had taken three to complete her flight. Her adventures were eagerly followed around the world, as newspapers published reports sent in regularly by her. She also kept a journal which was the basis for her book. I must say I'm tempted by that idea too. For now, though, Anyone who's interested in finding out more can watch a documentary based on my experiences from the flight.
Now you will hear the talk again. Thank you for inviting me to be part of your inspirational women celebrations. My name is Tracy Curtis Taylor, and I'm a commercial airline pilot. But my biggest passion is flying vintage planes, which are old aeroplanes built during the first half of the 20th century. Planes have been an important part of my life from very early on, thanks to my father, who often took me to see them in Canada, where my family moved to from Britain. But it wasn't until I relocated to New Zealand in my twenties that I fell in love with vintage aeroplanes. Around this time, I started researching the pioneering female pilots of vintage planes, and one name in particular caught my attention: Mary Heath. She was an extraordinary woman. Whose solo flight from Cape Town in South Africa to London in 1928 brought her international fame. I felt she deserved to be brought back into the spotlight, so I decided to recreate her flight over Africa. My preparations for the trip took nearly five years, time mainly spent looking for a sponsor to help with the expenses. After that. Finding a suitable plane or attracting media attention to create interest in such a project wasn't as hard as I'd expected. On the second of November, twenty thirteen, I was finally ready to take off from Cape Town International Airport. The first stage of my flight followed the coast of South Africa to Port Elizabeth. I knew I was in for a treat with stunning views, though the sighting of dolphins was unforgettable. Flying along the coast was so peaceful. Using the same type of open-topped plane as Mary Heath herself meant I encountered numerous challenges that she'd also had to contend with, such as frequent weather changes and fuel shortages. Luckily, Mary didn't have to put up with extensive paperwork when stopping over at different airports. I finally reached my destination after two months, while Mary had taken three to complete her flight. Her adventures were eagerly followed around the world as newspapers published reports sent in regularly by her. She also kept a journal, which was the basis for her book. I must say, I'm tempted by that idea too. For now, though, anyone who's interested in finding out more can watch a documentary based on my experiences from the flight. Question Eight, Part B. Now listen to a conversation between two students about another inspirational woman called Elizabeth Blackwell, and complete the sentences in Part B. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the conversation twice. Ready to start on our presentation, Mariam? Absolutely. I'm glad we were asked to prepare one on inspirational women from history. Yes, I think Elizabeth Blackwell was a great choice. Not only was she the first woman to obtain a medical degree in the United States, but she also helped other women to do the same. Yeah, she must have been so brave to deal with all the prejudice she faced. I know, job opportunities for women were very restricted in the 19th century. There were only certain jobs that women were allowed to do, like working for wealthy families as a nanny, looking after their children, or as a tutor. Elizabeth opted for the teaching role when she was still a very young woman. And actually, I found out that a few years later she became determined to become a doctor after witnessing her friend's serious illness and feeling powerless to help her. And that's what drove her to apply to numerous universities, and all but one declined her application. Now listen to this. Before they accepted her, professors at this university requested that the male students vote on whether Elizabeth should be permitted to study there. <laughs> Luckily for her, they thought it was a practical joke, so decided to go along with it. She graduated from the university in 1849, becoming the first female doctor. Extraordinary. 
I read that after graduating, she went to Europe for two years to gain medical experience. While she was working as a midwife there in France, she contracted a disease that left her blind in one eye. This shattered her dream of working as a surgeon. She returned to the U.S., but much later in life went back to Europe as a lecturer at the London School of Medicine for Women. Right. I read that she faced many problems as a woman in New York, such as being rejected by employers, although she had encountered this type of discrimination before. What she found overwhelming, though, was dealing with landlords turning her away when she inquired about rooms. Support from her friends and family wasn't in short supply, though, and saw her through these times. Oh, right. But then, in 1857, she finally opened her own hospital, which provided health care for the poor and employment for other experienced women doctors. This was a real achievement for Elizabeth, but nothing filled her with as much satisfaction as providing training for women doctors who just obtained their medical degree. Excellent. Let's start working on the text. Now you will hear the conversation again. Ready to start on our presentation, Mariam? Absolutely. I'm glad we were asked to prepare one on inspirational women from history. Yes, I think Elizabeth Blackwell was a great choice. Not only was she the first woman to obtain a medical degree in the United States, but she also helped other women to do the same. Yeah, she must have been so brave to deal with all the prejudice she faced. I know. Job opportunities for women were very restricted in the 19th century. There were only certain jobs that women were allowed to do, like working for wealthy families as a nanny, looking after their children, or as a tutor. Elizabeth opted for the teaching role when she was still a very young woman. And actually, I found out that a few years later, she became determined to become a doctor after witnessing her friend's serious illness and feeling powerless to help her. And that's what drove her to apply to numerous universities, and all but one declined her application. Now listen to this. Before they accepted her, professors at this university requested that the male students vote on whether Elizabeth should be permitted to study there. <laughs> Luckily for her, they thought it was a practical joke so decided to go along with it. She graduated from the university in 1849, becoming the first female doctor. Extraordinary. I read that after graduating, she went to Europe for two years to gain medical experience. While she was working as a midwife there in France, she contracted a disease that left her blind in one eye. This shattered her dream of working as a surgeon. She returned to the U.S., but much later in life went back to Europe as a lecturer at the London School of Medicine for Women. Right. I read that she faced many problems as a woman in New York, such as being rejected by employers, although she had encountered this type of discrimination before. What she found overwhelming, though, was dealing with landlords turning her away when she inquired about rooms. Support from her friends and family wasn't in short supply, though, and saw her through these times. Oh, right. But then, in 1857, she finally opened her own hospital, which provided health care for the poor and employment for other experienced women doctors. This was a real achievement for Elizabeth, but nothing filled her with as much satisfaction as providing training for women doctors who just obtained their medical degree. Excellent. Let's start working on the text. That is the end of question 8, and of the exam. In a moment, your teacher will collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number and candidate number on the front of your question paper.
Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, please collect all the papers.